a familiar face sits before us. Welcome. I, um, I'm going to ask you to introduce who's the fellow sitting next to you, uh, Mr. Reagan, on your left. Our, our EPA budget director. Um, no, what's he do, What's he doing here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, top financial questions. officer. I should clarify. Oh, good. Chief financial <laughs> officer. <laughs> we'll see if his lips move when you speak. About that. So. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to uh, call this um, hearing to order and to join Senator Capito in uh, welcoming back <laughs> Administrator Michael Regan before our committee to uh, discuss President Biden's fiscal year. 2024 budget proposal for the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, I think it was about two years or so ago that you sat uh, pretty much right here. And uh, I'm trying to remember who was sitting right behind you in the audience, right behind you. There's a young guy. Uh, I looked, he looked to be about eight or nine years old. What's, what's his name, Matthew? The, the, the superstar of the Regan family, Matthew. Yeah. He, uh, I, was, I want to just say, we've got a couple new members to on our, on our team. Uh, some of you uh, will recall, he was the best behaved eight or nine year old kid I've ever seen in my life. So <laughs> I think we, we said later on, Shelly and I were talking, we, thought, we said we thought you probably had a medicated in order to, to be able to behave that well. No, just the promise of a lot of Pokemon cards. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. We're happy to welcome uh, you back uh, today to uh, discuss uh, President Biden's fiscal year 2024 budget proposal for the Environmental Protection Agency. Over the years, uh, I've often said that budgets are about priorities, or as the late Jim Frock once said, anybody ever heard of Jim Frock? Probably not, but you've heard him say, you've heard the saying, the saying is, don't tell me where your priorities are. Show me where you spend your money, and I'll tell you what they are. Jim Frock, and uh, rest in peace, Jim Frock, wherever you are, but you're gone but not forgotten. But budget proposals are an opportunity for our presidents, Democrats, Republicans, and, and others as well, to lay out a forward-looking version for the people of our country. And I believe that President Biden's $12 billion budget request for EPA, after years of starving the agency, starving the agency for years, uh, prioritized now the, the needs of the American people. At this moment in history, Americans want a well-resourced uh, EPA that takes action to protect our health and our environment, especially when tragic accidents like occur like the recent uh, Norfolk Southern train derailment in uh, East Palestine, Ohio. Communities uh, throughout the US that are overburdened by legacy pollution want a well-resourced e uh, EPA that works to uh, clean up the air they breathe and the water they drink, as well as the contaminated land, which if cleaned up, could uh, be used for economic development and, and job creation. And those of us who are concerned about the future of our planet, and that's just about all of us, want a well-resourced EPA that takes strong action to combat the greatest threat we face today on this planet, and that's our climate crisis, while at the same time creating millions of new jobs in the process. Earlier this week, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its latest report underscoring the, uh, the urgent use, uh, use, urgent need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As many of us uh, here know today, climate change is already impacting communities across our country, large and small. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, extreme weather fueled by climate change in the form of uh, hurricanes, flooding, drought, and wildfires cost American taxpayers nearly $170 billion in 2022, that's it, $170 billion in 2022. That's billion with a B. And to put that, uh, put that figure into perspective, that's about 14 times the size of your budget, uh, Mr. Regan, at, the, at EPA. Fortunately, last uh, Congress, uh, we worked to pass the American Rescue Plan, bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. My thanks to everyone who's worked on uh, one or more of those bills. In doing so, we have directed EPA to do more than ever before to tackle climate change, address pollution, and protect your health in a way that supports economic growth. I'm a recovering governor. We had a couple of others here under the recovering governors. I'm always looking for how do we support economic growth and job creation. I'm never, it's never far from my mind, and, and it is especially uh, here in my mind today. But how, you may ask, well, we've tasked EPA with overseeing historic investments in clean drinking water, free of contaminants like PFAS and lead, 
We've also invested in EPA's work to clean up legacy pollution from contaminated urban brownfields, abandoned wells leaking methane, acid uh, mines leaching heavy metals, and more. And we have empowered EPA to help build a clean energy economy made here in America, made here in America with good paying jobs and lower energy costs for households across our nation. The President's budget uh, would build on our legislative progress by providing EPA with the resources it needs to implement these new programs that Congress has created. Among them are the Clean School Bus Program, the Methane Emission Reduction Program, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and new investments in wastewater facilities, all while continuing the important work of carrying out our nation's bedrock environmental laws. Make no mistake, the agency truly needs these investments. It's no secret that EPA has not always received the resources, at least in the last decade or so, the resources required to be successful. In recent years, flat budgets and staffing shortages have severely undermined the agency's ability to do its job in many respects. As EPA's responsibilities and workload continues to grow in the face of climate change and other human-caused environmental disasters, it should come as no surprise that the agency is overburdened. That's especially true when we look at the agency's workforce. EPA's current uh, number of staff, that's about 15,000, is well below the range of 16 to 18,000 that the agency had from 1990 through 2012, below the range we had in 20, 2012. For the years, we've asked the EPA to do uh, more with less, much less. Unfortunately, instead of proposing to slash the agency's budget further, as the previous administration did, President Biden's budget proposal would increase the EPA's budget by roughly 19% in fiscal year 2024 as compared to the previous year. It's really a leveling up of where we ought to be if we had uh, not uh, cut uh, the, the, bu the budget so much. The increase in funding under the President's budget for EPA is necessary as the agency works to rebuild itself and address emerging and ongoing challenges. It's also worth noting that the President's budget would add nearly 2,000 full-time career staff at EPA. Staff levels either have been cut in recent years or are actually frozen. And uh, at the same time, we think your workload has increased uh, dramatically. But these additional staff would make a real difference in the agency's ability to do things like manage toxic chemicals under the Toxic Substance Control Act, which we passed uh, with a big bipartisan vote in this committee a number of years ago, but it's still it's not being fully implemented because of the lack of staff at EPA to do that. Uh, other things that, the other, that need to be done is to convert contaminated brownfields. Almost everybody on this committee can think of brownfields in our states that are contaminated and, and it could be turned into areas for economic opportunity. And also we need to replace a bunch of lead pipes throughout our country and probably throughout it, every state that's represented on this committee. I'm also pleased that EPA's budget would make good on President Biden's uh, Justice 40 initiative and ensure that all Americans, including those in historically overlooked and underserved communities, receive their fair share of federal assistance from EPA. As co-founder of the Senate Environment, uh, Environmental Justice Caucus, I'm particularly grateful that this budget focuses on the need of our most vulnerable uh, communities of color as well as low-income American Indians and uh, Alaskan Native communities. I call them the least of these. It's something um, that I know that you, Mr. Reagan, uh, continue to prioritize as well, along with the folks you lead. You know, you should know that uh, many members of this panel, including me, support your efforts to advance environmental justice. Indeed, we have a moral <coughs> obligation to do so. Let me close by saying that I believe President uh, Biden's uh, budget represents a brighter vision of the future for our nation, all of our nation, from coast to coast. One that delivers on the promise of cleaner air and cleaner water in every zip code and better ensures that every American has the, an opportunity to live up to the God-given potential. So Administrator Regan, I know uh, we're heading in that direction thanks to your outstanding leadership at EPA and the work of the team that you're privileged to lead during an especially challenging time in our nation's history. We look forward to hearing your testimony today and to the responses that you'll give to the questions that uh, we'll be posing. Before I do that, I'm happy and delighted to turn to our ranking member, Senator Capito, for her opening remarks. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrator Regan, for being here. It's really good to see you. Um, while we both know we don't always agree on policies, I really appreciate your willingness to meet 
and talk and how seriously you take your commitment to testify. So very appreciative. A lot has happened since you appeared here uh, for last year's hearing. The EPA has received enormous funds, enormous amounts of funding. In addition to the am, uh, annual appropriations for fiscal year 2023, the EPA uh, received an astounding $41.5 billion in additional funding as part of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which many of us refer to as the reckless tax and spending spree. For context, that's four times the appropriation that EP would receive in a typical year. As part of the funding, EPA received hundreds of millions of dollars specifically for administrative expenses, which could include hiring personnel for implementation of the IRA programs. With these eye-watering numbers, I was quite surprised to see in fiscal year 2024 proposal that EPA requests another $1.9 billion increase over last year's annual appropriation, including more money explicitly for the IRA program implementation. Across the country, with inflation, high energy prices, grocery prices, and rising interest rates, Americans are having to do more with less, but EPA got more and still wants more. I am particularly troubled by the largesse of this request because I'm not convinced that EPA is using the resources it has already has effectively. I recently received a response from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that had some eye-popping statistics about current office attendance and work culture. I'd like to get similar answers from you today about the EPA workforce. Last year when you testified before the committee, we discussed EPA employees. When would they be back to work in person? And you said, quote, all employees are scheduled to be back by the last period in April 2022. This year's budget proposal suggests, however, that back in the office does not mean actually present in the office. We are heating, cooling, and cooling massive and nearly uninhabited buildings three years after the pandemic started. Now, with the public emergency over, I want to understand the agency's current work practices and how we can avoid some of this energy waste for, to the benefit of the environment and the taxpayer. We need to do this before we seriously consider any more administrative outlays, including the EPA's desire to hire approximately 2,000 additional FTEs. The need for so many additional workers is at best questionable given recent EPA announcements about how it's going to manage large buckets of money appropriated by the IRA. The EPA is sitting on more money than it's had in its history, and I find it worrying that its method for handling some of these particularly significant new pots of money is to push implementation to groups outside the agency and beyond traditional accountability and oversight. Take, for instance, the $3 billion Climate and environment, Environmental Justice Block Grant Program from the IRA. The EPA, with that program, receives a 7% administrative expenses set aside, so that's $210 million, a lot of money, even here in Washington, right? And according to the EPA's plans for initial awards under the program, all your staff is going to do is pick a limited number of third-party grantees outside the agency, which then can then take another 20% to administer and distribute grants to their grantees. Doesn't sound like an efficient way to use taxpayer dollars to me. Unless current plans for the program change, the EPA will get $210 million for doing not as much as I'm sure the vision of the, the, those who voted for the IRA thought. These investments, which could be partisan uh, and could be environmentally meaningless, I guess that's in the eye of the beholder, already will then have a more than a quarter of those dollars is going to be blown on administrative uh, costs before it even reaches, uh, before it even gets started. So I'd like to discuss that, my concerns today about the way that you're prioritizing certain regulatory actions. The agency spent a lot of time and resources completely rewriting and finalizing a broad new Waters of the U.S. definition. But we're waiting for the Supreme Court to make a ruling in a pending case. That threw yet another definition of WOTUS into effect, and now that definition has already been stayed in, I believe, just two states, but maybe more. The EPA could have minimized regulatory uncertainty by just waiting for the Supreme Court ruling. During that same time, the Biden EPA took two years two years to develop a proposed drinking water standard, but believe me, I'm happy you finally did, for PFOA and PFOS. It concerns me that the EPA Water Office could have been prioritizing PFOS instead of writing the WOTUS rule, which is going to have to be changed in all likelihood after the Supreme Court makes its decision this summer. Meanwhile, the agency continues to go full bore on a regulatory agenda targeting energy and power sectors. 
one that's gonna hurt my state's economy and further raise energy bills. The EPA continues to push forward with its so-called EGU or electric generating unit strategy. As part of that strategy, the EPA recently finalized a water rule targeting coal plants called the ELG rule. It says the ELG rule is aligned with other rules so that we can help the industry be very thoughtful about long-term investment for all the regulations that are coming out of the agency. That's kind of code word for me. How are you gonna shut your plants down? You went on to say, quote, not aimed at driving specific outcomes in terms of investment strategies, but I would disagree. I think it's clear what the administration is doing in an accelerated transition from coal and natural gas. Seems to be the playbook here. The Biden administration is calling the shots uh, that were started during the Obama administration's war on coal. Earlier this month, uh, Mr. Goffin and I uh, talked about the EPA modeling uh, from, uh, and I know you and I talked about this actually at breakfast the, the other day, uh, that the IRA is a gut punch to the coal and gas industry. Uh, the EPA modeling projects that the ERA could lead to transformative impacts on the power sector, including a dramatic decrease in not just generation, but also capacity. We see that uh, in, in the projections generated from, from the EPA itself. So uh, I'm concerned about potential job loss in Appalachia all across the country uh, in, in the natural gas industry, and I, I'm very concerned about what we see coming out. But today we're gonna talk about the budget and other things. Um, and I'm worried uh, about the oversight in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act, since it looks like you're sort of outsourcing some of the oversight to these other uh, age, these sub-grantees. And I wonder what kind of app, uh, what kind of oversight we would have there. Not to mention the 27% in administrative costs that are going to be dedicated towards uh, engaging those dollars. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Senator Capito. A tale of two cities here at the uh, in my Environment and Public Works Committee today. I just, uh, just wanted to reiterate something I said in my, my opening statement. Earlier this week, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its latest report underscoring the urgent need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And he said it's actually getting worse faster rather than slower, and in part of the sense of urgency. Someday, 10, 20, 30 years from now, Folks are gonna gather here in this room serving on this committee, and they're gonna either say, what were they thinking? What were we thinking as we considered this budget and the priorities of uh, this administration in our country? Or they're gonna say, thank God, they took some steps that needed to be taken to make sure that our children, our grandchildren have a future. Uh, my wife and I have uh, a three sons, and we have uh, uh, four uh, grandchildren. Uh, and uh, well, so I, I wanna make sure that they have a planet to grow up on. I want to make sure they have a planet to go old on. And the work that we're here today is uh, really, uh, with that in mind, all of us, almost all of us have kids or grandchildren. And I think we want the same thing for, for them. Um, with that uh, in mind, Mr. Uh, Regan, thanks for joining us, thanks for your statement, and for being with us today. We'll begin uh, uh, with uh, like hearing from you and uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Carper, and I want to thank Ranking Member Capito and members of this committee. I really do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the necessary vision laid out in the United States Environmental Protection Agency's proposed fiscal year 2024 budget request. In this budget request, we lay out an ambitious and transformative plan for EPA with the goal of building a healthier, more prosperous nation while ensuring global competitiveness, energy independence, and security. President Biden's proposed FY 2024 budget request for EPA provides $12.1 billion to advance key priorities, including protecting air quality, upgrading our nation's aging water infrastructure, tackling the climate crisis, and rebuilding the core functions in our agency. Over the last year, we've made significant progress towards these goals. I'm proud of the foundation we've laid and the partnerships that we have developed to underpin the successes. But there is still much more work to do to ensure that all of our children have safe, healthy places to live, learn, and play, to build a stronger, more sustainable economy, and to advance American innovation and ingenuity. Simply put, investing in EPA is investing in America. Across the country, poor air quality still affects millions of people, perpetuating harmful health and economic impacts. For fiscal year 2024, the agency will protect our air quality by cutting emissions from ozone-forming pollutants, particulate matter, and air toxics. The President's budget 
budget includes $1.4 billion to improve air quality and to set standards that reduce pollution from mobile and stationary sources. EPA's work to set these standards provides certainty to the industry, builds on advances in technology, and reinforces market movement toward a cleaner energy system that provides reliable and affordable energy. A thriving economy also requires clean and safe water for everyone. Although progress has been made, many still lack access to healthy water, face inadequate wastewater infrastructure, and suffer from the effects of lead pipes. America's water systems are also facing new challenges, including cybersecurity threats, climate change, and emerging contaminants such as PFAS. The budget proposes more than $4 billion to upgrade water, drinking water and wastewater infrastructure nationwide with a focus on underserved communities. Over the last year, I've had the privilege of traveling across the country, from Jackson, Mississippi to East Palestine, Ohio. I've visited communities in your states and seen firsthand the environmental and public health challenges that many of your constituents continue to face. I've spoken to families who've been sickened by the air they breathe. I've met with people who, have, who live with toxic waste in their backyards. I've seen conditions that are simply, simply unacceptable in the United States of America. From investing in our nation's climate resilience to cleaning up contaminated land and water, there is no shortage of important work to be done. And members of this committee, I assure you that EPA is up for the task. We're eager to work with all of you to deliver for our fellow Americans and to secure our nation's global competitiveness. But we do need your support. Both the urgency and economic opportunity presented by climate change require that we leave no stone unturned. And we know the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies have not always ensured the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national or origin, or income. In fiscal year 2024, EPA requests more than $375 million and 265 FTE for the Environmental Justice Program. The funding will help to expand support for community-based organizations, indigenous organizations, tribes, states, local government, and other territorial governments so that they can identify and develop solutions to their environmental justice concerns through multi-partner collaborations. The FY 2024 President's Budget positions the EPA to create durable environmental policy, investing in America and setting our nation on a path to win the 21st century. It will allow for us to meet the pressing needs faced by millions of Americans and fundamentally improve people's lives for the better. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and to submit this testimony for the record. And I look forward to our continued partnerships to achieve these ambitious yet necessary goals. And I welcome all of your questions. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Regan. Um, let me just ask uh, for, for the records, is the, in, in the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is it fully paid for, is it fully offset, or does it create or increase our deficit? Uh, fully paid for. It's fully paid for, fully offset. Imagine that. Uh, the, uh, uh, are we losing jobs in, uh, in this country over the last uh, couple of years or are gaining jobs? Any idea? Uh, gaining significant jobs. Yeah, uh, would, uh, if I told you it's like the number is 10.7 uh, million jobs have been created in the last two plus years, would you believe that? Well, it's true. The unemployment rate, what is the unemployment rate today? What is it? 3.4, which I think, if I, last time I checked, is the lowest it's been in how many years? A long time. I think that's a good thing for us to keep in mind as we take up these, uh, these issues. I, I say that my, my colleagues get tired of hearing me say this. It's possible to do good things for this planet, clean air, clean water, climate change, and create jobs. And we are doing it. And we can continue to do it. And we need to do it in a fiscally responsible way. All right. I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, in his project, President Biden has clearly prioritized protecting public health and the environment. Uh, EPA uh, needs more people and additional funding to do the critically important life-saving and planet-saving work we're asking you to do. This includes reducing the greenhouse gas pollution that's driving climate disasters, working with industry to support a host of new well-paying jobs in clean energy industries, and ensuring that EPA can effectively respond to chemical disasters like the one that the we, you visited in East Palestine, uh, Ohio, in Darlington uh, Township, Pennsylvania. Here's my question. Mr. Reagan, how would the additional people 
and funding recommended by the president in his budget help the agency you lead fulfill your mission to protect public health and the environment with an eye toward reducing emissions, promoting economic growth, and increasing resiliency to natural and man-made disasters. Go ahead. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Carper, and I want to start by thanking you and this committee for your leadership in passing the omnibus bill, the bipartisan infrastructure law as well. Uh, these pieces of legislation have helped the agency move the ball forward to invest in America. Uh, the town of Ellenborough, West Virginia, which received $1.5 million to address aging infrastructure. The town of Temple, Oklahoma, approximately $1 million in loan forgiveness to upgrade its water treatment facility. And Chairman, in your own city of Wilmington, Delaware, expected to receive a half a million dollars to upgrade its dewatering process to remove PFAS in the wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, in order for us to continue the great work uh, like this, um, you know, we need additional resources to uh, continue, and that's included in the proposed budget. Uh, you know, additional funds would invest in our infrastructure, uh, more than $4 billion to upgrade drinking water and wastewater infrastructure for all people. We do know that we received uh, a lot of resources through the bipartisan infrastructure law for water infrastructure, but we also know that those resources pale in comparison to the size of the problem. But once we move beyond well, clean and safe drinking water, um, additionally in the 24 budget request, it would enable EPA to fully realize the promise of the bipartisan uh, TSCA uh, law that this committee wrote, uh, getting pro protective chemical safety rules on the book while also getting the innovative new chemistries needed to propel the semiconductor, automotive, and battery sectors forward is extremely important for us. So last year's appropriations help, uh, but this year we needed a little bit more. All right, thank you. Uh, my next question is uh, environmental justice communities, uh, frontline communities and disadvantaged communities are disproportionately affected, as you know, by environmental hazards. I'm a firm believer, I know you are as well, in something called the golden rule. I think if you ask questions of everybody in this panel, they say we're all in favor of the golden rule, treat others the way we want to be treated we're in the same uh, situation. Uh, that means we must ensure fair and equitable uh, treatment for, the, for these uh, communities too. I know that uh, you share a similar desire to assist and uplift those communities that have been affected by toxic pollution. Here's my question. How does this budget proposal do, and what does it do, to help the communities that need it the most, including those economically volatile and environmental justice communities? Go ahead. Well, Senator, I believe in the golden rule and I believe in rising tides lift all boats. Um, I'd like to start by saying 85% of this budget request goes to states and tribes. I believe that states- Say that again. 85% of the budget request goes to our states, our tribes, our local governments, uh, which as a former state regulator, I believe that our states and communities know better than the federal government and they have the solutions. I've traveled all across the country in the backyards of Jackson, Mississippi, to Mandan, North Dakota, to McDowell County, West Virginia. And I've, I've heard the stories, I've seen with my own eyes, the struggle that many families have for clean air and clean water. This new national program and these resources create a laser-focused laser opportunity on environmental justice, uh, you know, which we can do that while providing a clear uh, point of accountability for both our internal and external stakeholders in coordinating this EJ work. So we're excited to see that many states are actually revising the definitions of disadvantaged communities for the state revolving loan fund programs as a result of our guidance. Uh, we're excited to see that our state, tribal, and local partners are embracing these resources to create equity in all of our communities. And so, you know, this budget does request additional resources so that we have the capacity to ensure that every person in this country has access to clean air and clean water. All right. My time is almost expired. I'm going to yield to Senator Capito, who has stepped out of the room for just uh, a moment. Uh, I, who would be next? Uh, to, to Senator Kramer, would you mind picking up the oh, if time you, and running with if it? If I must. Uh, please. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to, I'm afraid I might jump ahead of Senator Capito, even in the questions on, on my first question, since she, she brought it up in her uh, opening statement. But first of all, uh, Administrator, thank you for being here, and thank you again for your trip to North Dakota. As I mentioned to uh, Administrator Fox uh, last week, um, it, it, was a, it was a fun day. 
I hope that you found it useful. I know that you implemented some of the things you heard from our landowners and farmers and concerning waters of the United States. And um, while we still think it comes up way, way, way short, um, you were there showing up matters and um, and you did listen and, and we appreciate that a lot and continue to look forward to working with you more. Um, the, the chairman um, said that we, we asked the EPA to do more with less. I, I'm asking you to do less with less. Um, I, I think this this is that he talked about tale of two cities. I'm talking about tale of two philosophies. Um, and I'm going to start by by challenging you a little bit on what I think Senator Capital probably wants to talk to you about as well, and that is why the EPA went ahead with a WOTUS rule, an, a durable WOTUS rule, when the last it, it was anything but durable, considering we're in the middle of a uh, of a uh, a case at the Supreme Court, the Sackett case, and now awaiting that ruling. All to this dur durable word was, of course, to it prevent the ping-ponging of the rule. Um, 24 states have already challenged your, your new rule. Um, wouldn't it have made sense to, to just wait till after the EPA maybe have a more durable rule and then free up all that time and all of those resources to do something, you know, a, a higher priority perhaps? Well, uh, Senator Kramer, and I think maybe my count is right now we have two states that have challenged the rule. Um, maybe more will, will join. You know, when I embarked upon my listening tour, I think farmers and ranchers asked uh, for certainty and durability, uh, recognizing that the, uh, the Trump navigable waters rule had been vacated and that there was no uh, clean, uh, Obama clean water rule in place, which means we were faced with uh, a pre-2015 scenario. So we worked really hard. Uh, we held regional uh, listening sessions all across the country, we went through a very thorough regulatory process and, you know, basically um, I think we looked at the pre-2015 regulation and what we did was we codified uh, two Supreme Court rulings post-2015 and then in this rule I think we threaded a, a very good needle and what we did was we codified uh, over eight exemptions that were requested by the ranching and farming community uh, in addition to providing this durability or this certainty to move forward. Now, uh, we recognize that the Sackett case will have some impact on the rule, but what we didn't want to do was wait until after June, wait for the Supreme Court, and then start a two-year process, which would have left farmers and ranchers in limbo. All right. Uh, I, I, we're going to disagree on that for, for sure, um, and, and we'll, I don't, don't want to get into the details of orders right now because I do want to move on. Speaking of, you said I think 85% of the, the money in the IRA is for, for EPA goes to states or something to that effect. Um, the authority rests with states. That, that, that's the area where I'm the most concerned. W with regard to uh, another Supreme Court ruling, of course, on the, um, on the, uh, the um, Clean Air Act ruling, West Virginia versus EPA. Um, I worry that, that the EPA is still presuming authority that it doesn't have. After that ruling, uh, and, and I'll be I'll be real specific. In the IRA, there's there's 45 million dollars specifically for perhaps using within Section 111, which is what of course um, West Virginia versus EPA was all about, to to engage in in um, in even more Clean Air Act intervention, if you will, on the part of the EPA. Is there anything in the IRA in addition to the 45 million that gives the EPA this authority? To, um, to go at the source and, and to fuel change or to, to suggest fuel changing or require fuel changing um, for generation? Is there a new, new authority that you didn't have before? No, what I would say is that the Supreme Court made it clear that it was not permissible for EPA uh, to base emission guidelines under Section 111 on generation shifting. Right. And so... The court's decision did not draw any conclusions regarding any other control measures, but it was spe specific there. Uh, so we are designing, we have an obligation. Uh, the law requires that we put forward a regulation around greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we are following the Supreme Court's ruling. We are following our Clean Air Act authority. We have engaged extensively uh, with the power sector on this rule. And so I can uh, assure you that we're going to stay well within the guardrails, but our rule will uh, set the structure for 
the opportunities in this country, especially those that have come about because of the Inflation Reduction Act? Well, I, I do prefer states' authorities, of course. I think the Supreme Court does as well. I, I, I was going to ask next about the methane rule because I think it's similar. It's another one of those things where state primacy is being dictated um, or over, you know, overridden by, by the EPA Perhaps, and I, as I always like to say, please don't impose the federal government's mediocrity on my state's excellence. Uh, they just do it so much better. And it doesn't cost as much. But anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You thanks, Sen us. thanks, Senator Kramer. No, you bet. A uh, couple of unanimous, uh, unanimous consent requests. I, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, recent economic data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, which show that the, our economy added this last month in February another 311,000 jobs, 311,000 new jobs. Surpassing uh, economic uh, estimates, uh, which would call for about 200,000. So the unemployment rate remains near an historic low of just 3.5%. Uh, uh, compared to what? Well, that's the lowest rate in unemployment in this country in almost, ready for this, 54 years. 54 years. I also ask unanimous consent to submit for the record of a, uh, a December 2022 fact sheet from the EPA that confirms that the new WOTUS rule does not impact long-standing permitting exemptions provided in the Clean Water Act for agriculture activities. The Clean Water Act has exempted normal ongoing farming activities from permitting since 1977, and the President Biden's WOTUS rule does not change that. This fact sheet explains the new rule actually includes new exclusions long sought by the agricultural community, including a definition for prior converted cropland and exclusions for certain ditches, irrigation areas, and artificial lakes and ponds. And with having been said, I'm happy to yield to my... Well, uh, reserving the right to object. Yeah, go ahead. Reserving go ahead. the right to object. Do, do either of those documents uh, speak to uh, the inflation rate um, that consumers are having to pay for products like eggs and groceries and agricultural products? I'm going to check, and I'll get back to you right after this hearing, okay? Well, I'll withdraw my reservation. You bet. Thanks so much. All right. I would notice for the last six, seven months, uh, each, each, each month you may have noticed, the cost of inflation, the rate of inflation is going down, 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 down. And if they are the, in, the Federal Reserve continues to do their job and we do our job, maybe it'll just keep coming down. I hope so. Uh, uh, with respect, I, I haven't noticed it going down, down, down. Uh, All right. There have been um, upticks in certain sectors and down in others. Inflation is a, a okay. serious problem. I just wondered if uh, those documents... Senator Cardin. That. Senator Cardin. S sir, hold on. I'd like to... Just, no, just... Well, I want to object to... If you're putting your labor statistics into the record, I'd want to object to it, too, because I'm reading the labor statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it said, actually, unemployment rate edged up to 3.6% from February 2022, not the lowest that we've seen in record history. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, if you start looking at it, uh, people that left the workforce is 5.1 million in the last four weeks, which is would almost double the unemployment rate. So your statistics aren't accurate to what you're saying for your employment. So your staff, either one, didn't brief you right on that, or they didn't read the same Department of Labor statistics to which I'm reading. All right. So you're saying the unemployment rate has gone up from 3.5% to 3.6%? I'm not going to get in an I'll, argument with you. I'll read, I'll I'm read not it, get in you, an argument when you say that it, okay. it's Thank not you very accurate much. when you say that it's actually dropped. All right. Regular order. Thank you. All right. Who would be next? I think I am. Senator Mr. Carden. Reagan, wake up. Welcome to our committee. <laughs> Everybody says we're just nice, one big happy family. Everybody says nice <laughs> things about you. So um, uh, thank you, and I appreciate your visits to Maryland. We know it's easy on your travel budget when you visit our state, so we will always welcome you to the state of Maryland. Uh, I also want to thank you for your help in regards to our prior, priorities and for the Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake Bay region. The budget provides uh, forty-seven point. $6 million in FY24 from the bipartisan infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure bill that provided $238 million to the Chesapeake Bay over a five-year period. So we appreciate those funds being made available. And we also appreciate your budget that increases the Bay program directly by $100,000. So I just really want to acknowledge and urge you to continue to work with the surrounding states in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, as well as other agencies, including the Army Corps, as we develop strategies to move forward with the Chesapeake Bay. On, on a second issue, I want to just acknowledge uh, the challenges you have uh, in regards to your, the work that you're doing for the phase three greenhouse gas emissions for heavy trucks. Mm -hmm. Maryland is home to Volvo Mack Truck, 1,500 jobs in Hagerstown, 
Uh, they're working on the, uh, the electric uh, vehicles, uh, the electric trains, uh, uh, should say the electric drivetrains for new clean trucks. Uh, our concern is, and we've mentioned this before to you, is that as you develop your, your rule, be mindful of this infrastructure or structures that are available to implement this in transition. And we think the work being done in Hagerstown is important to that. We want to preserve the, that manufacturing here in the United States and make sure that we can comply uh, within a reasonable period of time of any of the new requirements that are made. But let me uh, go to one of the public health challenges. You said you're prepared to meet these public health challenges. So you've been to Back River uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant in Baltimore. You know the challenges we have there. Just recently, there was an explosion and fire. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But we do know that that plant discharges an excess amount of nutrients and bacteria. And Baltimore is not alone. This is a problem that we see in many of our wastewater older plants throughout this country. My question is, it needs resources, but it also needs help in developing the proper management structure in order to meet the needs going forward. You indicated you're up to the task. So tell me how you're going to be up to the task to help us in Baltimore and other places in this nation that have real challenges in their wastewater treatment plants. Well, thank you, Senator Cardin, for that question. And we, we are up for the, the challenge. And part of our strategy there is to leverage our strong regional leadership. We have 10 regions across the country that work in very close partnership with our uh, state, um, state regulators. And so we're, we're heavily engaged in, uh, the, with the Department of uh, Environment in Maryland and Baltimore City around how we look at this particular issue, uh, the backwater issue, blackwater issue. Um, and we have our regional administrator, Adam Ortiz, who's got his finger on the pulse there. And he's doing a great job. I really want to just acknowledge uh, his incredible work in Region 3. Well, thank you. And, and, you know, he is doing an incredible job. And part of that is ensuring that uh, these states get the resources that they, they, they are, um, deserve. And, and so as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, when we look at that 50 or so billion dollars, uh, there's a significant hundreds of millions of those dollars that we're providing directly to states for technical assistance. That now, technical I, and assistance. And I think that technical assistance yeah. is going to be very important because we do have a resource problem, but we also have a management issue. So I hope the technical assistance will be sensitive to meet those needs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let, let me raise one additional issue in the time that I have remaining, and that is on the lead uh, abatement uh, issues that you're dealing with. There's two grants that are are going to be funded, I think, at a tune of about $219 million in the president's budget. Tell me how you're going to target those funds, particularly to the underserved communities that have had the challenges in the past in dealing with lead poisoning with, in their homes and their schools. How do we target it to make sure it gets to the communities of greatest need? Well, and that's one of the really important tasks, not only of the entire agency, but of our new Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. Uh, number one, we're grateful for the language in bill that basically stipulates a certain percentage of these resources must go to disadvantaged communities. We also know that many states already have a lead inventory, and those that don't are continuing to develop that. And so we do have a formula in place, and we do have a structure in place that ensures that those who need these resources the most will get them first. We're grateful for the $15 billion in bill that targets eradicating lead pipes, but we all know that there are more financial needs in this country than the $15 billion. That's why this budget request is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator. And uh, Senator Capito has uh, graciously uh, yielded to Senator Lummis for the next round of questions. Senator Lummis, you're on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member. I appreciate it. Um, and Minister Reagan, Reagan welcome. Um, I, I would comment first before I ask a question about PFAS that it's simply impossible for EPA to absorb and responsibly spend the amount of money that is being requested. Um, and I, I look forward to visiting with you about uh, if this amount of money is thrown at EPA, how, how you think you could possibly spend it responsibly. Uh, anyway, that's just an editorial comment. Um, at Minister Regan, I've heard from public wastewater utilities concerned that a CERCLA listing for PFAS could leave them liable 
to bear the costs of contamination, putting the onus on local communities and households. Public water and wastewater utilities did not produce or benefit from PFAS, but since it flowed through their systems, they could be left bearing the cost associated with cleanup, which will mean higher rates in people's water bills. If a designation moves forward, does EPA plan to hold public wastewater utilities and local communities liable for PFAS contamination under CERCLA? Well, thank you for the question, Senator. <clears throat> and, and our goal is to use all of our enforcement authority uh, to hold the companies responsible. Uh, accountable. Uh, that's goal number one. Uh, number two, we do not want the burden and the onus to fall on our wastewater uh, treatment facilities, especially those smaller ones in our, our rural communities. And so that's why there is $8 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law, thanks to many of you all that got that in that law, uh, that will provide some financial uh, reassurance to these smaller communities as we begin to pursue uh, this this er, this regulation. Does EPA have authority to provide exemptions because exercising enforcement discretion doesn't seem sufficient? Well, we do have enforcement discretion. I think that we have to look at the tools that we have within our toolbox, and enforcement discretion is one, but it's a very powerful tool that we can use. Do you have statutory authority to provide exemptions? We don't. Okay. We, we have the in enforcement discretion tool. Can EPA use its regulatory authority to strengthen existing federal exclusions under CERCLA, <laughs> including the federally permitted release and normal application of fertilizer by clarifying that these apply to public wastewater utilities adhering to their Clean Water Act permits? I will have to take a look into that. Perfect. I thank, thank you for that answer. Um, I'm, and I'm going to uh, submit some other questions for you for the record. Um, but with my remaining time, I'd like to switch to uh, the good neighbor rule and ozone transport. Um, in your most recent ozone transport rule, the EPA released updated modeling showing Wyoming's contribution to downwind states at 0.68, which is below the 0.7 parts per billion national standard for ozone threshold. The EPA should have approved Wyoming's state implementation plan rather than deferring. Any other action is arbitrary and not in accordance with the law. So do you have a time frame? of when the agency is going to act on Wyoming's plan. Well, I'd, I'd like to say I've enjoyed my conversations with Governor Gordon. I think our teams are working extremely well together. I think it's because of that productive relationship that we divert, deferred action on Wyoming. I don't have a particular timeline with me now. We can follow up with that. Um, but I think it is instructive that the conversation that we had with, uh, uh, with Wyoming uh, was one of the reasons that the good neighbor rule was as targeted as it is, using the best available information, having these constructive conversations, not only with governors, but state regulators, I believe produced the best results for the country. Well, thank you. I, I do believe that the EPA should have approved Wyoming state implementation plan rather than deferring because we fall below EPA's own updated modeling in a way that makes us compliant. Uh, and so the fact that, that um, this hasn't been approved is a, a source of um, frustration. Um, I have some questions, Mr. Chairman, about small finery exemptions, RFS, and uh, coal combustion residual, and some other things I'll submit for the record, uh, and look forward to continuing some of these conversations with you. Thanks so much, Administrator Regan. I yield back. Thank you. So, thank you. And uh, uh, Senator uh, Padilla, what were you doing? Uh, I don't know. How old are you? How old are you? How old are you, really? The, uh, so we're putting us on blast. Then. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> How old are you? Uh, turning 50 today, sir. 50 today. So like 50 years ago today, you made your first appearance. <laughs> Give your mom. Uh, is your mom still alive? Your mom's still uh, alive. We lost mom a couple years ago, but... Uh, well, we are grateful to her for bringing you into the world and sharing you with uh, all of us. And with that having been said, Mr. I'm not going to ask Mr. Chairman, would you yield the floor for sure, just sure, a second? Sure. 
Uh, I had to schedule, 50 is a good time for a midlife crisis. I scheduled mine because I, I wanted to have one, but I was too busy, so I scheduled it. And um, I went to Surf Divas in your home state of California, which is an all-women's surfing school for pencil-pushing women. And uh, it was absolutely tremendous. So uh, I recommend that you take your... Um, uh, and schedule your midlife crisis, and I wish you a very happy birthday. I don't know how to top that, but you're recognized. <laughs> <laughs> well, however you, long you wish. Thank no. you, Senator Lomas. I uh, would think about scheduling it, but I think it would conflict with another hearing of the Environment and Public Works Committee, <laughs> and I will choose to go to committee <laughs> instead of a crisis. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, want to begin by also thanking uh, Administrator Regan uh, for your staff uh, and their close collaboration with me and my office uh, on so many pressing uh, issues, uh, not just for the country, but specifically for California in the areas of chemical cleanup, clean water, and clean air challenges. Now, earlier this month, if your scheduling process is anything like mine, it might not have gotten to your eyes yet, but you do have an invitation from me to come to California and visit the South Coast Air Basin to see again firsthand how pressing air quality challenges are uh, uh, impacting the community, uh, in particularly as a result of the tremendous amount of goods movement that we see in Southern California, proud to play such an important role for not just our regional, but our national economy. But it doesn't come without impact, uh, as you can appreciate. So I do hope to see you in the Los Angeles area very soon. Uh, now, as you know, and as you will see, uh, air pollution from mobile sources like freight trucks, ships, and locomotives disproportionately impact the health of lower income communities, communities of color, tribal communities, and other marginalized communities. And while California is certainly doing all it can, it can, we've leaned in at the state level and at the local level to tackle sources of air pollution under state jurisdiction and local jurisdictions. These heavily polluting mobile sources that remain our biggest challenges are under federal jurisdiction. And so... Uh, we need to continue this collaboration. We need the EPA to expedite reductions in pollution from these mobile sources. I also want to recognize, in all fairness to you, that years of underfunding during the Trump administration has made it particularly challenging for EPA to fulfill its obligation to these disproportionately impacted communities. But thanks to your leadership, these past two years, there's been this new life uh, that's uh, taken into the agency. And your rules, like EPA's recent rule strengthening emission, emission standards for heavy duty vehicles are establishing some of the most significant uh, protections that we've seen in decades. Uh, now EPA has a mission to also protect public health and advance environmental justice. But that work cannot be done without sufficient resources and staff. I know Chairman Carper asked generally about staffing needs, but uh, I want to uh, ask you to specifically address how increased funding for EPA's Office of Air and Radiation can enable the agency to move forward on this work to cut pollution and to save lives. Well, thank you for that, Senator uh, Padilla, and thank you for your partnership. Absolutely. If you uh, talk to my staff, um, they are very grateful for last year's uh, budget, but we are still in need of significant resources. There are some that might suggest that we can't absorb these increases. Uh, that's a hard message to give to people who are already worked, overworked, and working six and seven days a week. So absolutely, when we look at the challenges facing our country, especially on the transportation side, uh, the amount of skills and resources uh, and bodies that we need to keep pace with a changing uh, economy and technologies, we absolutely need these bodies that we're requesting. Um, we did publish a heavy duty trucks uh, rule in December of 2022 focused on NOx, but as you're noting, we have another obligation to do another trucks rule focused on greenhouse gas emissions. And so we're continuing to move forward 
with these regulations that, quite frankly, are technology standards. They are really driving the markets and where technology is going, and we have to keep pace with that. So in the Office of Air and Radiation, when we look at a good neighbor rule, our transportation rules, our 111 focusing on the power sector, our mercury and air toxics rules, these are the same individuals focusing on significant regulations that have to capture the market, analyze technologies, and do all of these things in a way that we can remain globally competitive. Uh, thank you very much. Um, time is uh, zipping by fast, so I'll just uh, raise another issue and submit it in the form of uh, questions for the record after the hearing, and that's uh, acknowledging the, the, the vision and leadership that you're providing, as well as a significant amount of investments that Congress has approved in recent years through the bipartisan infrastructure law, through the Inflation Reduction Act, and how we advance this whole-of-government approach, bringing along other departments and agencies to advance this priority of, uh, again, not just environmental protection broadly, clean air uh, specifically, and bringing all the other powers uh, and uh, resources of the uh, federal government to bear. So we'll, we'll follow up with you and uh, your team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Padilla, thanks again for sharing uh, part of your birthday with all of us. Happy birthday from, from all of us uh, across the aisle and on the same side of the aisle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Happy you're with us. Uh, Senator Capito, is, uh, is next she's yielded uh, graciously, Senator Mullen, and, uh, and then uh, uh, whenever she wants to ask her questions, she'll be recognized. Well, Senator for Mullen. Fortunately, I haven't uh, reached that 50-year mark, and I don't plan on getting there anytime soon or anytime faster than I have to, so I don't know about the midlife crisis yet, but I'll take your advice. Uh, for, for, the, <laughs> for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I sit on the committee that has uh, jurisdiction over the Department of Labor, and that's why I wanted to correct the statistics to what you're quoting. Uh, and I will do so if you correct, if you say something that isn't actual correct statistically speaking. I will I will be happy to make sure we understand for the record. Please do. It will, um, sir. Going to um, going to WOTUS for a little bit, and I want to talk about heavy trucks. Uh, a federal court recently um, struck down, or actually put a preliminary injunction stopping the implementation of WOTUS into two states, Texas and Idaho. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Thankfully, the court didn't uh, grant Chevron deference. You've consistently said that you want a durable rule, quote, uh, at the end of the day, by, but at least 25 states, which is half the country, uh, are suing to prevent WOTUS rule from going into effect. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Uh, given that everything is happening in the courts, aren't you just gambling uh, on this one, hoping that the courts will apply Chevron deference to the WOTUS? We didn't see it as that. We, we looked at this rule, and we've got 45 years of experiences in terms of what has happened in the past. Right. Uh, we took a look at the fact that the Trump rule was vacated. There was no Obama rule. And so this rule basically uh, tries to take advantage of every experience. You have, you have half the country, which means half of the local jurisdiction uh, over their backyard, over their environment, is saying, whoa, we don't want this. EPA is overstepping here, half the country. You don't think that's something that you should take in consideration? I mean, Washington, D.C. doesn't rule the rest of the world, nor does it rule the rest of the country. I mean, there is, there is states that have the right to oversee and regulate if they're able to do so. And we have 25 states that are saying, we don't want WOTUS. Uh, do you not take that in consideration at all? Or you just say, hey, Washington knows best. Forget you all. We're going to do what we want. Well, you know, I, I basically have to say that the, the Constitution and the statutory authorities and the request by right. Congress for us to execute on safe and clean drink of water laws is what guided my actions. But I there, do understand. But what does, what is, what is, when you start looking at the Clean Water Act, you want to get in that, it specifically talked about navigable bodies of water. Sure. Intermittent streams that eventually flow into navigable bodies of water is not what Congress covered. Congress was very specific underneath the Clean Water Act when it stated navical bodies of water is to which we would have uh, jurisdiction over. So how are we overreaching in this? Uh, and that's where I get into. This is where something I think you need to take into consideration. I respect the job that you did in North Carolina, and we spoke about that. But I think we need to take in consideration the rest of the, the rest of the country. Going to what's your definition of environmental justice? You mentioned that in your statement. That's why I say that. Well, I think the definition, not mine, but the definition is, is that everyone, despite your race, uh, you know, your, your community, your zip code, uh, your income, everyone deserves equal protection under the law from environmental pollution. 
So the 25 states you just ignore? That's half the country. 25 states. Well, 25 states are saying they don't want WOTUS. You're talking about clean water, clean air, environmental justice. WOTUS does do with that. 25 states are saying they don't want it. And you're going around. I, I, think, I think part of our, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue this conversation, right. the, the tension is that you, know, you, you, you have what the Clean Water Act requires for us right. to do. You've got Justice Kennedy's opinion. You've got Justice Scalia's opinion. opinion and then you have where we are today. I think we did our best job to look at what Congress has requested, mm -hmm. to take a look at those two justices, to look at what the Obama administration and Trump administrations failed to do, and to respond in but, terms of what we're required community, to do. Which is provide communities that service. live in this environment, communities that live right where they right where they they stay, like my family's been in Oklahoma, right where we're at since 1830s. <laughs> I think we know our backyard better than the EPA, yeah. and no one takes more pride of it than we do. Uh, no one plays in the creek and swims in the creek that my kids play, and nobody from the EPA that I know of, they never have. I promise you no one has more, better interest in it than I do. And I would just like the EPA to take that in consideration. Real quick, going to heavy trucks. I know we're talking about, um, you know, uh, zero emissions, but as the EPA took in consideration the, the safety and health and the hazard that it would cause on the roads, because when you take uh, uh, combustible out and you put in electric vehicles, you're going to add a minimum of 5,000 pounds to it, plus you're going to add length to it. So you're going to have a two to one option that you're going to add for every truck that's on the road. And congestion has already taken place in California, which is causing a humongous uh, backlog on our on, on our supply chain. And if you take in considering their rule, and they're going to buy have de facto by saying if they go to zero emissions, isn't that going to affect interstate commerce, how we're going to get equipment to and from the rest of the part of the United States, and not to mention that we're going to add a tremendous amount of traffic on the road? EPA needs to be considering this because we don't have the infrastructure to add these additional trucks on the road. And so before we just continue down this road, we need to once again, sir, take all this in consideration. And I'm sorry I'm out of time. If he, if he, he sir, if you want to give him time to respond, he can, but I, I'm out of time, so I'll yield. Yeah, just for, very briefly. Um, yeah, I'd love to continue the conversation. The, the statements uh, suggest that we have not taken those things into account. And when you see the proposed rule that's coming out in the weeks to come, I think you will see much of that taken into account, but we can have that conversation. Good. Uh, before uh, before uh, recognizing uh, Senator Kel Kelly, let me just say, uh, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record several letters that are collectively co-signed by over 100, 100 stakeholder groups, including some in my home state of Delaware. Those letters were in support of the 2023 WOTUS rule and describe the negative impacts that a Congressional Review Act Resolution to repeal the rule would have on water, wildlife, and human health. These letters reflect that the stakeholders who support the 2023 WOTUS rule span both urban and rural areas and include small business owners as well as millions of Americans who rely on outdoor recreation for their livelihood. Senator, uh, Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Administrator Regan, uh, good to see you again. <clears throat> Almost three years ago, uh, the EPA announced the creation of the Office of Mountains, Deserts, and Plains, which is a new regional office focused on effectively cleaning up abandoned mines and mine lands across the West and accelerating the cleanup of Superfund sites on Western lands. And the EPA um, needs to do more to clean up the hundreds of abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation. There are more than 500 of them. And, you know, tribal leaders, you know, just like tribal leaders, I am concerned that these sites fail to compete well for annual Superfund appropriations funding. And I believe that a properly funded and authorized Office of Mountains, Deserts, and Plains can make meaningful progress on these projects. But Administrator Regan, you know, I... I noticed that the uh, fiscal year 24 EPA budget does not include funding for the Office of Mountains, Deserts, and Plains. Can you explain why that is? Uh, yes, um, and I will echo your sentiments. We absolutely understand the importance of, of this particular office. Um, you know, this particular office receives its funding through the Superfund Emergency Response and Removal and Superfund Remedial Program. Uh, which in the in this budget, this FY 2024 budget, um, is proposing the president's proposing to transition to Superfund tax receipts. 
so it is definitely built in. It's just built in under the Superfund program. So you say the EPA budget does include, my question was, my understanding is it doesn't include funding, but you say it does include funding, but it's coming from another source. Yes, it's coming from the, the Superfund program, primarily from the Superfund uh, tax receipts program. And do you have an amount of funding? So um, our chief, finan chief financial officer indicated that we are anticipating collecting over $2 billion this year uh, to be used for the, the subsequent year. So you say the Office of Mountains, Deserts, and Plains will be we'll funded a, at that level? We'll, we'll get a percentage of, we'll get some of those resources coming out of that $2 okay. billion. All right. Yes. Can you get back to me on what that number is? We can. Okay. I've introduced uh, legislation with Senator Lummis to authorize the Office of Mountains, Deserts, and Plains. So did you support this legislation? Uh, we have uh, absolutely provided technical assistance to previous legislation. Um, and so we've weighed in there. Uh, any additional or new legislation, we will be happy to continue to provide that technical assistance to be sure that we're accomplishing the shared goal. And can you share with us any ways that you think that Congress, like what can we do to, to ensure that the office has the authorities it needs to support Superfund cleanups in the Western United States? We feel pretty confident right now that we have the authorities. Uh, would love to continue this conversation if there are some perceived um, you know, indications that we don't, but we believe right now we have those authorities. Okay. Great. In the remaining time here, I want to talk about PFAS for a second, so I'm going to shift gears here. It's important to Arizona, cleaning up PFAS. Uh, groundwater is our backup source of drinking water for both Phoenix and Tucson. Um, and it is going to become more, more critical if this uh, extended drought gets worse here in Arizona. Um, but our groundwater aquifers in both Phoenix and Tucson, they have growing PFAS fl plumes. And I understand the EPA has just finalized a drinking water standard for PFAS just last week and more regulations may be finalized soon. So taken in combination with funding from the infrastructure law, I'm hopeful that these actions can help make a difference for Arizona communities. So, Administrator, um, will the new proposed drinking water standards, will that speed up any of the EPA's timelines on releasing bipartisan infrastructure law funds for treating um, contaminants like PFAS? It absolutely will. We'll have them time to coincide with this regulation and the needs that these communities have. Over $10 billion in bill focused on PFAS and emerging contaminants, $5 billion of that specifically focused on PFAS. So yes, all of these things, our regulations and that law are working in concert. Well, thank you. Thank you. Senator Keller, thanks for joining us today. And now, Senator Capito. Uh, is recognized. Senator Capito, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Administrator. I'm going to go just sort of very granular. This should be pretty easy questions. How many people are full-time equivalents at EPA right now, today? Right now, we have 14,900 employees. 14,900, and you can go, what's the what's the max, 15? Uh, 15,000, yes. 15,000, and you... This budget is asking for an additional 2,000. Of the 14,900, how many are in the office five days a week? Um, most of our employees are working on a hybrid schedule, just like the rest of the federal government and corporate America. Uh, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that we are definitely meeting all of our performance targets. So our staff is fully engaged in. So you don't have a percentage direction. of how many people actually come in every day? We can get you that percentage. Okay, yeah, I'd like to see that because in your budget you talk about hoteling, which means you're going to share space. Uh, you have a vision of sh some sort of shared space arrangement where uh, somebody would use an office and then the next person who comes in uses the same office. Is that correct? I think what we're trying to do is, is do what everyone else is doing, which is think about how do we have a responsible policy in place that leverages our workforce. Um, whether you're in corporate America, state government, or the federal government, uh, people have hybrid working conditions, and we're trying to be sure that we're accommodating that schedule while meeting our mission. Yeah, I'd also like to see when you're giving the statistics, 
how many people are in the office three days every two weeks. This is the same statistic we have from the uh, NRC. Because, I mean, this is, uh, you and I have talked about this a little bit, something that I'm deeply concerned about, what kind of um, culture we're creating here if, we're, if, if, if nobody's seeing anybody and nobody's in the same workplace. I mean, this is reflected not just in government, but also in private sector. So we can get those statistics from you. I'm going to put two charts up here that were generated by, uh, I used them with uh, Mr. Goffin last week. Um, basically, just I just want a quick answer from you. These were generated by your EPA. They basically are showing that uh, in coal capacity and natural gas generation, that because of the IRA, uh, coal capacity will be significantly lower uh, than it would be had we not had the IRA. And the same with national, uh, natural gas generation. These are models that he stands by. I would like a confirmation that this is EPA's firm projection of where the IRA is driving um, our energy um, uh, production. Yes, those models look consistent. So the IRA will directly in, um, cause closures of natural gas and coal power plants uh, in, in all certainty. Uh, let me ask you about the, if... yes, let me ask you about the three, because I talked about this in my opening statement. I want to give you a chance to respond. Sure. The $3 billion climate environmental justice block grant program. I uh, was shocked to see that EPA gets a 7% administrative uh, expenses, $210 million to basically give money to subgrantees, and that they get another 20% for administrative. I mean, is that an efficient way to use government money? And what kind of oversight? And who are these people? Well, we, we definitely have uh, very good oversight over our grant program. Well, you might, but what, do we? We're the ones who are providing the dollars. I mean, is that something that you're going to be fully transparent on so we can see where these dollars are going. Absolutely. It'll have the same transparency for all of the resources that Congress affords to EPA. So this won't be treated any differently. Who uh, are who are these groups? Who are, these, who are the groups that are going to get the bulk of the $3 billion climate and environmental justice? Do you have a list? Some of the groups, I'm sure we do have a list, and maybe some I we need don't to have see a the full list. list. Sure. I mean, and I'm envisioning... These, these grantees will meet all requirements and oversight uh, principles that all of our grantees do. I mean, we're, we're not treating anyone any differently. But this doesn't is a it responsible seem, way. Doesn't it seem like 27% of the dollars that the IRA, which none of us voted for, which is billions of dollars, is going to go to administrative costs? Is that really providing environmental justice? 27% of that is already out the door. These are similar percentages to all of our administrative oversight and, and cost dollars for pass-throughs and grant programs. So th this may be a issue that we have with the government's grant programs, but this program is not being treated any differently than any other grant program that EPA administers. Well, I think one of the issues here is the enormity of the dollars. I mean, uh, you, uh, EPA received $41 billion, and yet the president wants another 19% increase, 2,000 more people, when with the 41 billion, you're allowed to hire people to move forward these programs. I, I, to me, it's just mind boggling in this time of fiscal restraint or where people are really watching their dollars, this kind of overreach and overspending. I mean, it just seems so exorbitant to me. Well, we're, we're not solely a, an energy agency. I mean, we focus on environmental protection. So IRA and Bill don't afford dollars to very critical programs that oversee uh, TOSCA, pesticides, herbicides. I mean, we have a lot of programs that are in need of resources that don't fit neatly under the umbrella of IRA and Bill. And so I would say that, you know, while the percentage seems high, the dollar amount that EPA is asking for uh, of an agency this side and the scope and the magnitude of our responsibility uh, is, is a catch-up game. We, we've been in decline for, for decades, not just one or two administrations, for decades. And so we're trying to develop a workforce that can keep pace with a very challenging and growing economy. What increase did you get last year from your previous budget, percentage-wise? What percentage was that? Do you know? I think we're estimating a five percent increase, but we'll we'll get you that. Okay. Number. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, uh, Senator Capito. Thanks for yielding all your time.
being uh, so patient. Uh, well, next, uh, uh, Senator Reck, it's good to see you. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Regan, for being here today. Appreciate it. So I'm going to go back to the waters of the U.S. You said in your opening remark that you want a durable and certain rule, and that's going to be, I think we'd agree, it's best for everybody, correct? I'm sorry? Uh, you want to have a durable rule, correct? Yes. And that would be best for everybody if people had certainty, whether it's farmers or ranchers or small business people, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And you're familiar with the 1972 Clean Water Act, correct? Yes. And do you know how many times in that act the word navigable water appears? Uh, no, I haven't counted that. It's 50 times. 50 times they in that act it says navigable waters. And I'm going to pull up the... Merriam-Webster's dictionary here of the definition of navigable. And it says, uh, navigable, 1A, deep enough and wide enough to afford passage to ships. Navigable waterways, that's 1A. Then it goes on to 1B, capable of being navigated, like navigable train, and the two is capable of being steered. But the definition is pretty clear. Now, I get I'm from a landlocked state, and you know, we don't have lots of oceans around Nebraska. But to me, navigable means you can put a boat on it and go someplace. And you cannot do that from a pond on a farm. You can't do it from a roadside ditch that is temporary. And you can't do it from a puddle on a construction site. And yet, it seems that is what you were trying to do with this rule, is extend that very clear definition of navigable to waterways that are clearly not navigable. And you talked about exemptions, but you don't need exemptions when you're very clear that, that when it's very clear what Congress's intent was. Congress's intent could not have been more clear. Navigable waters, where you can put a boat and take a ship and go someplace. And that does not count for the things that you're trying to extend it for. This, to me, seems to be an expansion of executive power. And by the way, don't take it personally, Mr. Regan, because oh, no. you're not the first administration to try and expand executive power. But you're trying to expand the definition beyond what is, what is here. And my question then goes to, with the Sackett case coming up, won't the Sackett case, I mean, is it your opinion that the Sackett case is not actually going to clarify what navigable is with regard to these definitions? Well, I, I really wish it was as simple as you've just laid out. But to your point, uh, multiple administrations haven't gotten it right since 2015. Uh, the Supreme Court has weighed in multiple times. So it's not quite as, as clear as that picture you've painted. I, I do agree that the Sackett case will have some impact on the rule. And part of our calculation is this rule is designed to absorb uh, whatever uh, ruling the Sackett case renders uh, so that we can move forward with that latest version of the law. The reason we did not wait is because we have a rule in place that will be impacted. We don't know how much, potentially, by Sackett, and we will adjust that rule and move forward. If we had waited until this ruling in June, we would have had to start a two-year process, if not more, and that would have left uh, a, a lot more uncertainty because of the vacature of the Trump rule and because the Obama rule was not in place. So if the second rule, the Supreme Court comes back and says, no, navigable actually means navigable is defined by Merriam-Webster here and what Congress's intent was in 1972, aren't you going to have to go through that two-year waiting period all we, over again? No, we or believe that period? there are other aspects of WOTUS that we have already taken care of, and then we will adjust to that new definition. WOTUS is a little bit more expansive and impactful than just navigable waters. So we've taken care of all of those other externalities. We would adjust whatever decision we get from Sackett, and then we would be moving forward on what we predict to be a much shorter time frame. Okay. I also know, and this is just a yes or no question, you mentioned the regional listening sessions. Didn't your staff clarify that those listening sessions are not, don't count as official comments for the rule? Is that accurate? Well, I think those, it, it, one of the reasons to do that, number one, is it never hurts to listen. Number two, uh, we developed a very strong it's a partnership. It's a yes or no question, Mr. Regan. Partnership did, with did, your, did your staff clarify that those don't count as official comments for the rule? But it helps with implementation but, and execution. Uh, but, it, but it doesn't count for officials, is that right? Yes or no? In terms of? Yeah, I think your staff clarified that those comments don't count for the official comments on, on the rulemaking. But they count towards how the rule is implemented and how we partner with the USDA and the resources that USDA can bring to bear to help with the implementation of the rule. So those listening sessions were extremely valuable for both EPA and USDA. Okay. So I want to switch gears on you real quick with the few seconds I've got left. Um, with the new RFS rule, the EPA uh, put out biomass guidelines for three years. 
that are all below the what EPA says is the uh, 3.1 billion gallons, the capacity that the industry already has. Why did you set the targets below what it uh, was the industry was already creating? And if you're going to do that, I would ask, do it for one year. Don't make it something that for three years, when we know we're already at the capacity of 3.1 billion gallons, and you've got it below 3 billion gallons. Why did you set it below that? Well, I think that when we look at the, the lack of progress that have been made in the previous years, we had to go back and do the homework of a previous administration and catch up for 2020, 21, and 22. So we're looking at 20. Now we're looking at uh, set rules in the future. We're trying to set these volumes for multiple years so that we can create some certainty uh, in this space for the industry, which is what the industry has requested that we do. So I think the industry was pretty satisfied with where we landed on 2021, and now they're looking for that same trajectory and certainty in those out years. Well, I'm talking about 2023, though. You're setting the amount below 3.1 billion gallons, which is what the industry capacity is already at. Why did you set the biomass goal below what the capacity is already at right now? I'll, I'll take a look into sort of how to answer okay. that question accurately. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Ricketts. So we were joined by Senator uh, Sullivan before I uh, enter, uh, yield to, uh, to him. I'm gonna ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a, a letter submitted to the uh, Senate leadership it? from sportsmen's organizations, such as the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, the okay. American Sports uh, Fishing Association, the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the letter expresses supports for uh, President Biden's Waters of the U.S. rule and emphasizes the impact of clean water on hunting and fishing opportunities, as well as the economic benefits of hunting and fishing, such which are valued at some $200 billion per rule without objection. All right, Senator Sullivan, Thank welcome. You, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Regan, good to see you again, sir. Um, thanks for coming. So I have a chart that I keep trotting out to all your nominees and everything. This is the uh, global emissions chart it's fact-checked from 2005 to 2020. It shows the fact that isn't often discussed in our national media that the U.S. is the leader, leader by far of any country in the world on global greenhouse gas emission reductions. So you take here, that's America, some of our allies, Germany, UK, and then of course you got the dirty countries, particularly China, that's the greenhouse gas emission machine, right, a coal plant a month. Um, so I asked your nominees, I'm sure you've hopefully seen this, do you understand why that happened? What was the major reason that the United States has been the leader in the world on emission reductions? Do you know? And I'll give you a hint, it's not because of EPA regulations. Yeah, I, I think that is pretty clear, and I, I think I've been pretty clear that the markets over the past 10 years uh, have really steered this country to be as competitive as it is. I would also say that uh, the power sector has asked for more certainty so that they can make longer term investments, which is why we have worked to kind of bundle what the Clean Air Act requires us to do in terms of some of these regulations. Okay, or, so or the, answer, standards. the answer to my question, that's primarily the reason for that is the revolution in the production of natural gas in America the private sector, American innovators, American entrepreneurs undertook some great innovations and made clean burning American Alaskan natural gas the predominant power generation source, which dramatically helped us lead the world in emissions reduction. So that's a fact. So you guys should all know that. Um, so here's my question. You're the G7 delegate uh, you're, you play an important role in the G7 negotiations. Um, well, let me just back up here. If the rest of the world could undertake a chart and record like that, meaning you move from power generation sources into natural gas, you lower your emissions dramatically, wouldn't that help global emissions if other countries had this profile like we do? I, th I think that our country 
It's no, administrator, come on. These are really, these are really easy questions. You, sh you just say yes, right? That's the no. I, 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 I wouldn't it help? I reject the other of the statement. That, that profile. I reject the premise of the statement that natural gas is the reason You're, you that really? emissions are where they are. There's a combination. You reject that statement? Well, there's a. You got to go do your homework there, administrator. No, no, no. I've done a lot of homework. Okay, and, and, and there are so you, combinations what, what of you technology. Think the reason? The primary reason for that chart is? There, there are combinations of technologies that are driving our emission reductions in this country. That's just a fact. You don't think the primary reason for the emission reductions in America was a movement from coal power generation to natural gas? Oh, the revolution think, in the production of natural gas? I absolutely. That's a fact, too. I absolutely. And as the EPA administrator, gas. you guys are amazingly good at, like, avoiding this fact. I don't know why. You should be proud that America is the leader in emission reductions, and you should know the reasons why it is. So let's move on. But there is no accounting of the transportation sector in your, your statement here, and we know that transportation let's, is significant. Let's move on. Okay. Let's move on. All right. <laughs> G7, the Japanese want to make LNG and energy security a key part of their G7 presidency, which you are a member of in terms of G7 delegates. We've been hearing that some members of the administration were trying to thwart the Japanese on this that makes complete sense, particularly given this chart. Um, so a number of us in a bipartisan letter to Ambassador Emanuel, and I'd like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, um, have written saying we support that and we should have the Japanese support that. We were hearing it was John Kerry so I actually had a discussion with John Kerry down in Houston a couple weeks ago. He said, no, it's not him. He's supportive of a strong G7 presidency by the Japanese that emphasizes energy security, particularly LNG. So can I get your commitment as a G7 um, delegate on the energy and environment side to also support our ally Japan's strong uh, desire to want to make this G7 about energy security, lowering emissions, helping our allies, particularly in the aftermath of the brutal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Can I get your support to do that, which is what our allies are trying to do? John Kerry says he's good to go with it, so nobody else should be problematic on that issue. I, I haven't stood in the way of any of the conversations you just laid out. So, um... so if the Japanese are making that an important element of their G7 presidency, you'd be supportive of that as a G7? I've element. had a number of conversations with Ambassador Emmanuel, and I will continue to converse with him. I don't see any daylight in these conversations that he and I've had. I can't purport to know all of what you just yeah. laid out, but and I haven't talked to Secretary Kerry about this issue in particular. But EPA, Michael Regan, we have not weighed in on any LNG discussions that may or may not benefit uh, the country of Japan. So, Well, I mean, benefits all of us, right? This is part of the G7 negotiations that you're part of. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple additional questions for the administrator for the record. And um, it would be good to get your view. We can send you things that relate to this chart. It's very important uh, to have common understanding here. And I think the common understanding is that the revolution in the production of natural gas has played a critical role in emissions reductions in America and in the world, and that's a good thing. We should all celebrate. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, I ask uh, unanimous consent to enter record findings from PolitiFact showing that the United States is not leading the world in reducing global emissions, and it. Uh, uh, an independent, who, who is PolitiFact? Well, an independent fact-checking uh, journalism website. And the article finds, and this is a quote, relative to the scale of emissions in other leading economies. Other countries show much deeper uh, emission reductions. It's a close quote. The uh, article also finds that carbon dioxide emissions per person in the United States remain high compared to four leading countries between the years of 2005 and 2019. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection, so ordered. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm prepared to ask uh, questions uh, uh, next in this, this round in, in Senator Capito. I think uh, you, you have some more questions too, don't you? I, I have an additional question that I'm going to have to scoot. Do yeah. you want to go first? Oh, that would Would that nice. help? Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Administrator, I, uh, one of the issues, and we talked about this at the rail derailment with the, with, um, the EPA official that was there, is the 
mixed communication as to what's safe and, and crisis communications that EPA has um, moved forward with. And, and if you don't have specific and detailed information, the gaps get filled with misinformation and, and concerning. So I want to ask you about, I congratulate you on uh, uh, finally setting the maximum, con the MCL levels for, for PFOS. We talked about that. Um, but at the same time, oh gosh, several months ago, you put out something called a health advisory level. The health advisory level is so low that it can't be measured. So nobody knows whether the health advisory level is, uh, is safe or not. And so basically now you have two levels. You have a health advisory level, which is very low and unmeasurable, and then you have the four parts per trillion that you set last, uh, last week, I believe, uh, that uh, was considered safe. However, um, when uh, Assistant Administrator Radhika Fox was here, she said there's no safe level for PFAS in drinking water. This is a very sensitive, as you know, I mean, we all know, very sensitive issue uh, across the country. And, and, and very grave implications on how do we fix it, yes, but on the health side, what does this really mean? How, how is that kind of communication helping the American public, the mom with the kids or uh, those uh, grandparents with the frail health or anybody who's drinking, how, how are they really going to know with three, you know, the, admin, the assistant administrator is saying nothing is it, very low a health advisory, and then the uh, maximum contaminant level being slightly higher. How do you square that to the American who's turning on their tap every day? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. And this is, uh, it's been a challenge for risk communication for, for a long period of time. Obviously, whether it's lead, whether it's PFAS, uh, the agency traditionally puts out uh, what we call uh, a health advisory level uh, that really does follow the science and determine at what levels things are or are not safe. Uh, we put that out there because we want to educate the public because there are actions that can be taken beyond those actions that be can be taken by the federal government. So our standards are required uh, based on what is detectable and then the technologies available to get them to that level. Uh, just because something can be detected at a certain level and a technology can reduce it to that level doesn't mean that therefore it is 100% fully safe. And there is that gap there. And so there may be things that you can do as an individual or that a state and local can do to get even lower uh, vulnerabilities or risk or exposure to that health advisory yeah, so, level. So, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that the safe drinking level that you set last week is not really safe. Is that what you're saying? Well, it is. Uh, what, what we're saying is that we've... So why would you set it there? We've, set a, we've set a That's level that is more protective of public health, meaning we've set it at that four parts per trillion level because we can detect it at that level and we have the technology to reduce it to that level. It is more protective than if we had not had a regulation in place. Well, I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad that we have this MCL. I, I applaud it. I've been complaining for years that we can't get this level. And so under your EPA, you set the level, so thank you. But you're really saying that, I don't know, now I'm confused because what, what I'm hearing you say is, well, we set a level because that's all we can detect to, but we're not really sure it's safe. It's, it, see, this is, if you're sitting at home thinking, well, what does that mean in terms of turning on the tap and drinking? And, and so I just think we have to be really careful what we tell the American, I mean, I went through a water crisis with having chemicals in my own municipal system. It's a, it's a, crushing thing to live through and to try to figure out who's telling you the truth and what's safe and what isn't. And, and so I would just implore you to be, I, I, I don't know why you want to, wouldn't want to be unified with your, your health advisory level and your maximum drinking level so that people can be assured that your science is telling me that this is safe. So this is a discussion we need to have because I do think it, it foments confusion and I think it's um, difficult for water systems, but it's difficult just for regular folks to figure out uh, with everything in the news about FIFAS, what's really safe in my drinking water and am I, be, am I using the best 
methods that I can use. So we can talk about it. I just wanted to say there is a lot of confusion here, and I think we could avoid that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cap uh, Capito, I know you need to leave. I'm going to ask you to just to bear with us for just a couple more minutes. I need to take a call. And in the meantime, can I yield to Senator uh, Ricketts? And I'll be right back. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Regan. Um, <clears throat> As you know, uh, actually, well, maybe you may not know, I uh, was the, previously the governor of Nebraska, and I joined governors from across the Midwest to send you a letter to formally request the, you know, permanently remove the one-pound volatility waiver to allow states to sell gasoline, uh, you know, sell gasoline with E15 all year round. And again, this is an important point because as one of the things I love, I love this committee because I get to talk about this, and now that Chairman Carper's gone, I can say this and he won't. He won't get on my case. Um, <laughs> last time he corrected me and ended my time. But the, um, you know, ethanol is something that will help consumers save money at the pump. I just filled up my tank at High V a couple days ago when I was back in Nebraska, and I saved 60 cents a gallon. That was just E10. Uh, it helps clean up the environment. I'm, I know you know how much it reduces things like particulate matter and NOx and all that sort of stuff coming out. Uh, and then, of course, it's also great for our farmers and ranchers. And so we asked to be able to sell E15 one year, uh, all year round. And the Clean Air Act states that the administrator should publish um, the regulation resolving this action no later than 90 days after the receipt of a notification from a governor. Um, and, but our, no, our renewable fuels industry and producers and refiners didn't receive anything until March 1st, and this should have been done in July. So can you tell me why, explain why, it took more than the 90 days that's in the Clean Air Act to respond to this regulation. And what are your plans for E15 this summer? And I know that you've got a rule for next uh, 24 to be able to allow, but can you talk to me a little bit about that, please? Absolutely, and, and thank you and for, the, for the letters. I, you know, um, I understand why this is important, and I know it's important to you before you took this position. So we are excited about moving towards the waiver for 2024. Um, so, you know, we know the timing is different than what was initially requested. Um, and, and I believe uh, our folks were being responsive to uh, fuel distri distribution companies uh, so that they could be prepared for the next year and not this year. So, you know, I recognize that we're on a slightly different clock. I'll get you a more specific answer as to what took longer than the 90 days to figure out. But I can say that uh, we're excited about 2024. And for 2023, uh, what we'll have to do is, is do what we did last year, which is assess it case by case um, as we get closer to that time. All right, very good. And then I also want to get back to the biomass thing again real quickly, just um, because I do think it's important that as we look to take carbon out of the environment, we look at an all of the above strategy. And the biomass is important. Um, and one of the things I wanted to call out in that is I was talking to people in the industry. And do you know when we're talking about heavy trucks, the difference between the cost of a vehicle that can use the biodiesel versus an electric vehicle. You know the ballpark difference is? It's pretty big. It's a, I take it by you're looking at me, you don't really know that answer. It's $180,000 to buy that tractor versus $500,000 to buy an electric tractor. So, which is, and I think uh, my colleague, um, Senator Mullen, pointed out that when you have an electric vehicle, it's a lot heavier which means you're not going to be able to carry take it, you know, carry as much with you, and you're also not going to, you know, we've got the whole distribution issue, and it's also going to beat up the roads. So, again, that's one of the reasons why I think I would really would like you to relook at that biomass thing, because I think that's going to be important for us as we look at an all-above kind of strategy. And then uh, one other question I have is, uh, getting back to um, your budget request, you're asking for 2,000 new people, and help me with this part of it. So... I believe part of the justification, and correct me if I'm wrong, has to do with the Inflation Reduction Act and all the programs that are in that that you're assigned to be able to tackle. When this goes through the budget process, like when I was governor of Nebraska and we would have a bill, my administration would score a bill to say, hey, if you pass this legislature, we're going to need X amount of people, and that would go into a fiscal note. Does that, does that happen, or did that happen with this so that when the Inflation Reduction Act was being talked about, you had a chance to weigh in and say, hey, if you pass this, I'm going to need you know, 2,000 or 1,000 more people or anything like that. Is that part of the process? Um, we, we can provide technical assistance as these pieces of legislation are developed. I would just give you some real numbers when we think about the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, 0.5% uh, of that is for administrative. 
And so when we look at some of these bills, like TSCA, for example, that was passed in 2016, uh, you know, some of these bills are passed and they don't give the agency the adequate resources to keep pace with what the legislation requires. That's just part of the reality. It's not new with the Inflation Reduction Act. Again, go back to TSCA, we're facing that similar situation. And so that happens and we try to reconcile some of this through the budget process. And a good deal of that is what we're trying to do now. So we need to do a better job on our side of the house is what I hear, making sure that we're consulting with different agencies to make sure we get an accurate budget reading when we're passing these bills. Is that a fair statement? We do the best that we can uh, to provide the technical assistance to any piece of legislation to say, this would be the human capital impact to our agency along with what we think we need to execute or implement that legislation. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Ricketts. Um, uh, Administrator Wigan, again, we, we thank you for, uh, for joining us today and responding to our questions. You know, I, I want to ask a question, a couple of questions, but one is in, or deals with investments in state and tribal uh, air offices in permitting. Uh, it's easy to forget how a larger role that the states or tribes and local uh, governments play in implementing our clean air laws. EPA's budget provides, I think, $423 million. It's $423 million. It's a $158 million increase over fiscal 2023 in financial support to tribal, to state, and local partners to implement air quality management programs, including air permitting. My question, could you please provide uh, our committee with some insights on why these additional funds to states, to tribes, and to uh, local governments are needed, and how could these funds help with local air permitting and other local air and climate issues? Well, it's a great question, Senator. And, and you know, as you know, that for most of our water and state programs there, we have give delegated authority to the states for the, the implementation. So again, 85% of our budget request um, on average goes to our state, local, and tribal partners. Uh, they use these resources to, number one, do a lot of public engagement, uh, not just with communities, but with the companies that reside in their districts, those who are regulated by the agency. Uh, number two, they invest in air quality monitoring and other practices to be sure that they have the latest and greatest data so that the permits can be set at the accurate levels. And so again, these uh, state agencies know their communities better than the federal government. That's why they need these resources to continually engage, not only with the regulated community, uh, but the communities that are impacted by the pollution. All right, thanks. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, dealing with certainty and predictability, uh, uh, heavy duty NOx rule. Uh, throughout my, uh, my time in public services, it's been, it's been a while, um, <laughs> I, I hear more often than not that from the private sector about the need for federal government and state government and local governments as well to provide certainty and predictability. I hear it all the time. Uh, businesses need predictability and certainty to make long-term investments and decisions. That is especially true for vehicle and engine manufacturers who are making investments today for the uh, vehicles of the future. This past uh, December, I was fortunate enough to join your celebration of the signing of heavy-duty vehicle NOx rule. This rule will uh, reduce smog contributing pollution from our heavy-duty vehicles by 48 percent by 2045. 48 percent by 2045. I believe many companies were there celebrating with us. Here's my question. How is the heavy-duty vehicle NOx rule a good example of an EPA action that's good for public health and good for predictability and certainty for businesses that need, need it and, and, and ask for it all the time? Go ahead. It's a great example of how under this administration we have engaged with industry, with unions, uh, with our communities to try to get the best uh, technology standards possible. And so we were proud of, we are proud of this rule. Uh, we engaged heavily with the industry, uh, looking at where the markets and the technologies are going. Uh, we engaged heavily with the unions to ensure that there wasn't an adverse impact, but actually a jobs component to this. And we engaged with those communities, especially vulnerable communities uh, that are disproportionately exposed to NOx emissions. Where we think we calibrated this action was towards uh, a rule that satisfies all three constituencies. We're going to do the exact same thing as we continue to roll out other technology standards for the transportation sector. Looking forward to rolling something out in coming weeks on greenhouse gas emission reductions for heavy duty uh, and light duty as well. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask another question. Uh, would you elaborate on how streams and adjacent wetlands are very directly connected to the health of our nation's navigable waterways? 
Is that uh, why the 2023 Waters of the U.S. Uh, rule includes pr protections for streams and wetlands? Absolutely. Uh, we, we know that the Clean Water Act requires that we protect and not degrade, degrade our streams and our wetlands. We also know that our wetlands serve as natural filters to reduce pollution to some of our larger bodies of water. And so it was really important for us to be sure that we were protecting uh, not only our ecosystem and our waterways, but given our farming community, our ranching community, the flexibility uh, to perform the way that they normally do, which is in a protective manner. Uh, you know, we have done our best to look at multiple exemptions, codify certainty, and while also following the law to be sure that we don't expose ourselves to litigation while we're protecting the ecosystem. We try to strike that balance. We understand that everybody's not satisfied, mm -hmm. but we're trying to follow the law, follow the science, and work with our partners like USDA to be sure that we're not overly burdening our ranching and farming community. All right, thanks. I'm going to ask you to elaborate by responding for the record on how the 2023 rule responded to uh, concerns from stakeholders and is narrower than the 2015 Obama rule on isolated wetlands. I'll ask you to respond uh, for the record on that. It's, it's a much... For the record, for the record. Oh, on, yes, yeah, okay. On the record, yeah. Thanks. All right, Senator Sullivan's rejoining. Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm doing this for the ranking member. She didn't have time to ask the unanimous consent to enter into the record letters opposing the EPA's Waters of the U.S. final rule, supporting efforts to reverse the rule under the Congressional Review Act. These letters are from the uh, National Federation of Independent Businesses, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, representing our state officials most knowledgeable on the concerns of farmers, the Associated Builders and Contractors, and a coalition letter from more than 40 organizations opposing the rule from organizations including the American Farm Bureau, Association of Home Builders, National Association of Manufacturers, U.S. Chamber. So I ask unanimous consent for yeah, that. Without objection. And I also ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a coalition letter from many of these same stakeholder groups explaining specifically why the current WOTUS rule is significantly worse for farmers, ranchers, energy producers, manufacturers, construction workers than the pre-2015 guidance that would take effect if there was a CRA resolution of approval, disapproval passed and signed up. So- Yeah, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. So, um, uh, Mr. Minister, two, two final quick questions for you on topics you and I have talked a lot about. One is in December, you and I had a, what I thought was a constructive discussion re regarding the EPA's use of its 404C authorities. Uh, particularly, we talked about um, particular mining projects in Alaska, and you committed to me that any use of those authorities would not be precedent setting. Uh, when the EPA finalized its recent 404C action on the already denied pebble mine, uh, I appreciated your statement at the press event uh, where you said, by no means is this meant to send any signal for as a precedent beyond this specific pro project. And last week, administrator, Assistant Administrator Fox committed to me essentially the same thing that um, you had both in our meeting in December and what you said publicly. Since you're here in front of the EPW committee, this is a bit pro forma, but you've already committed to me on this. But for the record, will you make the same commitment about this not being precedent setting that you have in our conversations and then in your press statement? Absolutely. It's, it's definitely case by case, uh, not meant to send any signals. This is a tool that we use very sparingly, I yeah. think only three times in 30 years. So um, I think the record for that speaks for itself, and I think the, the Administrator Fox and I are 100% aligned on that. Great, thank you. Let me uh, let me turn to the issue that um, I know environmental justice, racial equity are important to you. Um, I wanna raise a environmental injustice in Alaska issue against the Alaska Native people that, um, you know, unfortunately, some people in this administration consistently overlook. This is another one, though, that you and I have talked about where I believe you uh, in your administration have been helpful. We have over a 1,000 sites that are contaminated land sites uh, that are owned by the Alaska Native people after the passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. That was 44 million acres of land 
uh, and the largest land settlement in the history probably of the world for Native people. And yet, in many cases, that land that the federal government um, provided to the Native people was contaminated. Now, I'm not saying the feds knew it was contaminated, but it's very contaminated, a lot of that land. And um, initially, believe it or not, it was unclear whether the EPA and the federal government was gonna come after these native organizations and tribes for liability to clean up land that the feds had given to them that was contaminated. Fortunately, in this committee, and I thank the chairman, uh, we worked together in a bipartisan way to say, hey, that would be nuts to hold them liable since they were the ones given the land that was already polluted. But what we need to start working on now is helping these indigenous people in my state clean up the lands. So would you agree that this is a environmental injustice that we got to work on to get, get them lands in an important landmark agreement, but a lot of the lands were very polluted and they can't use them. Yeah. Oh, I absolutely agree that we need to work diligently together to clean up these lands Good. that Thank are disproportionately you. impacting. And I will say your, uh, the EPA under your um, leadership has been uh, helping us on this, so I appreciate that. Um, it's going to take money, of course, to clean up. But the one thing I would like to just get a commitment from you on is working with, with us on some innovative approaches. You and I have talked about the mitigation banks for wetlands and things like that, where you might be able to get credit for cleaning up if someone, as opposed to putting land in a mitigation bank, was able to help clean up these lands, same kind of uh, overall goal to help the native people clean up their contaminated lands that were um, provided to them by the federal government. Would you commit to me again, uh, Mr. Administrator, help on not just the funding, which you guys have been doing a good job on, I commend you on that, but on some innovative ideas that we've talked about. The Trump administration had some really good ones, and I'd like to continue up, follow up on that with you. Yeah, our folks are focused, laser focused on innovation along with these resources, so absolutely. Good. And finally, let me just ask, can I get your commitment then in working with us to on these issues to ensure that tribes and Alaska Native corporations, remember ANCs were created by Congress, a lot of people forget that, that they are eligible for the brownfield grants to clean up contaminated lands. Um, right now in Alaska, there's confusion on who qualifies for that. From our perspective, if you want to help the indigenous people, it's through uh, tribal help. It's also through ANC help. There shouldn't be any um, uh, real differences. As a matter of fact, the ANCs are the ones that uh, own the vast, vast majority of the land. So not including them on brown, brownfield grants just kind of defeats the purpose. Can I, can I get your commitment on that? We've, um, we've got a $20 million grant program specifically for ANCSA for last year and this year in the budget request. Great. So ANCs and tribes. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've been joined. Thanks, uh, Senator Sullivan. We've been joined by S Senator uh, White House, Senator Markey. Senator White House, you're recognized and you'll be followed by Senator Markey. Thank you. Thanks very much. Administrator Regan, welcome. Glad to have you back at the uh, Environment Public Works Committee again. Um, congratulations on the progress that seems to be coming on GHG emissions rules and regulations. I appreciate that very much. You may have uh, said it in your prepared testimony, but do you have a general uh, idea of what the schedule is for the rollout of GHG emissions rules in the months ahead? We, we do, I would say for the 111 rules, uh, we're looking at uh, late April, and which focuses on um, controlling greenhouse gas emissions from our power sector. Uh, we have uh, rules coming out for our heavy duty vehicles and light duty vehicles uh, in the coming weeks. Yep. Uh, which we're excited ahead about. Ahead of that. the power plant ones. Ahead of the power yep. plant rules. And then we hope to have soon uh, a rule that's focused on uh, our uh, risk and uh, our, our mercury air toxic standard as well, which is important because it's an air toxics rule, but we are trying to provide 
some regulatory certainty and a picture for the industry and for our communities on how all of these things coincide with one another? Well, it matters a lot to us in Rhode Island, and I suspect Massachusetts as well, and I expect Delaware as well as downwind states, because we get a lot of that stuff that comes our way. And I can remember when uh, the plan for dealing with pollutants coming out of power plants was to raise the smokestacks higher so that it shot further up into the air and traveled away from the polluter state and landed more on our states. You know, thanks a bunch. So you guys being there to regulate that is really important to us because when the home polluting state has as their solution to simply dump it higher up into the atmosphere so it falls on other states more, that's not a great solution. Um, let's talk a little bit about methane. Uh, you guys have got a terrific methane rule rolling along. Um, we've talked before about how bad the reporting is of methane leakage. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, and organizations that have taken a hard look at it and considered that we're really underreporting by a lot. Uh, what are you doing to make uh, EPA methane reporting more accurate to the actual methane leakage that's out there? Well, we've been engaged in a lot of robust conversations uh, with the industry, uh, with the private sector, with nonprofits, um, looking at the best available technologies and best management practices that we can all use and coincide uh, with or, or collllaborate on. Uh, we do have a proposed rule and a supplemental that's coming out that uh, we that will is improve be, the reporting accuracy. It's going to improve the reporting, Good. Uh, the, the data collection, and the uh, innovation uh, around the technologies that can be used to control methane. That coupled with the $1.5 billion from IRA that will go directly to the states to help with some on the ground community led projects, yep. state led projects, it's going to be transformational for, for this sector and for methane. Now, we had um, your colleague in the cabinet, Attorney General Garland, into the Judiciary Committee, and in response to my questions, he uh, acknowledged that the Department of Justice was going to put together a task force to look at enforcement against methane leaks across the various departments and divisions uh, within justice. Um, and I asked him to keep building it out. Uh, that I'd like to see a whole of government enforcement approach in which EPA, Interior, Treasury, Justice, uh, and also potentially state and local enforcement officials had a role designing strategies to, when you find a leak, fix the leak, mm -hmm. and make sure that the response is quick by the lawyers to make sure it gets fixed. What is your status with respect to interagency cooperation on methane enforcement once a leak is detected. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud to say that we have a very strong relationship with DOJ on all of our enforcement programs. This one won't be in any, any exception. Uh, so our folks are conversing. Um, we are definitely prepared and taking a look at this new regulation and the supplemental and how it will be implemented and enforced uh, along with these resources, the $1.5 billion that we're doling out to the states to hold them accountable for uh, oversight and um, implementation and execution on how these resources will be put in place. So we feel pretty good about it. Good. Well, I urge you to uh, support a completely broad, across government, multi-agency, not just you and DOJ uh, task force to respond. And last of all, on methane, um, I know that the IRA was a big deal. Even with the IRA, we are still not on a pathway to climate safety. We're not even really close. We still need other major interventions. One of the most important interventions is the social cost of carbon. And I know there's one baked into your methane regulation and that that is working through the administrative process. I urge you to make sure that administrative process is as rabbit, rabbit, <laughs> rapid, <laughs> rapid and robust, not <laughs> rabid and robust although rabid might not be a bad way to look at it these days, <laughs> um, as rapid and robust as it can be to get that social cost of carbon into law as quickly and firmly as possible. Will you do that? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Senator White House, for interjecting a little levity into a committee that needs it right now. So, Senator Mark, you're on. Yeah, actually, rabid is how doc money groups view Senator Whitehouse uh, every day of the year. Who we'll strike that for the record. We'll yeah, strike he, that for the record. He's like the Jalbert no, of point, rabid. Point of honor for me. I don't uh, 
I don't, I don't resent that description at all, but <laughs> I am taking Marky's time, so let me yield it back. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, and uh, obviously the UN this week made it very clear that the world is now on thin ice and that uh, we have to do even more. So, uh, these regulations that the EPA is about to announce um, they're our response. They're the answer that we have to have for light trucks, heavy trucks, for utilities, for mercury. You know, strong new regulations send the right signal to the rest of the world uh, that we're serious about this, that we are going to be the leader, uh, that we lost time during the Trump administration, but now the United States is back, not as the laggard, but as the leader. So. Um, it's just so important that those regulations be the strong regulations that the, the planet needs, given especially what was just announced uh, this week by the United Nations. Um, and as well, and we thank you, um, Mr. Regan, for your leadership. You understand better than any administrator ever how local, hyper-local, so many of the effects uh, of pollution are and that hyperlocal air quality monitors can identify air pollution hotspots and power residents with information about the problems and the solutions of the injustice of poor air quality because we can't manage what we don't measure. Um, I've been introducing you know, legislation for years on environmental justice, air quality monitoring, uh, and a lot of funding was included in the Inflation Reduction Act in order to accomplish that goal. Uh, and the administration has already awarded over $53 million for 132 community air monitoring projects across the country, including to Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, and as we know, it's tribal, low-income communities, communities of color that have been living as uh, sacrifice zones. Uh, and it's just so important for us to ensure that um, healthy air is no longer determined by zip code. So, Mr. Administrator, will the EPA um, uh, have a strategy to uh, ensure that additional investments outlined in your proposed budget to ensure air monitoring data uh, can be used to address those um, sources of pollution and empower communities to take action? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the 2024 budget maintains that $100 million commitment for air monitoring. We're going to build on that with uh, what we've received in the uh, American Rescue Plan starting out uh, and then those resources in the Inflation Reduction Act. To your point, it is critical that these local communities have the technological ability to measure the air quality impacts that they're seeing on the front lines, feed that trusted data in concert with our state agencies' regulations to ensure that the permit reflects the adequate protection for the community. Beautiful. And um, in terms of the budget that you have, you are the watchdog on the beat. Um, is the budget that you're submitting allowing you now at the EPA to build your workforce, both through recruitment and retention, so they can properly perform their incredibly important job of protecting the air we breathe and the water that we drink? It is definitely putting us on the trajectory to do that. The percentage increase that we received last year was the first step. Uh, this year, I know 19% sounds like a lot, but when you look at the dollar amount and the needs of the agency, it's not, but it is positioning the agency to help this country stay globally competitive and keep up with the 21st century. Thank you. And uh, on PCBs, asbestos, lead, they continue to poison our schools, households, workplaces across the country. Um, and um, we, we absolutely have to provide the resources um, to make sure that we're focusing upon those issues. How necessary is this increased budget if we want EPA to actually be able to address toxic substances in communities and in our schools, as well as to get them out of our economy to begin with where they are completely unnecessary? It's extremely important. I know that Tosca was a bipartisan victory that you and others uh, hold uh, high. I know that it was one of the more personal motivators for you. And when I think about uh, an illness or illnesses that are caused by toxics like TCE and 
uh, the fact that we're just decades later finally getting to the point where we can propose uh, the right kinds of protections, it demonstrates how much of an uphill battle uh, controlling these hazardous toxics are. We need the workforce, we need the resources, and we're ready to do it. Yeah, the, uh, the on I only had two unions endorse me in my first race for Congress, and one of them was the asbestos workers. And uh, Joe Zampatello Sr. died from asbestos asbestosis ultimately that was my that's why I was always interested in that issue so to the extent to which you know in the 2016 bill um, mr. chairman that passed on uh, Tosca um, it's just so important that we get the resources to um, the administrator so that uh, that job can continue to be worked upon and I might add as well something that's very near and dear to the heart of the chairman and myself uh, it's the climate bank that we know that you're working on uh, to make sure that it's uh, constructed in a way that will maximize the incredible potential which uh, it has. And I want to thank you for working with us uh, in terms of the construction of it uh, so that it can ensure that every community in America has access uh, to the tens of billions of dollars uh, which can be unleashed. Uh, with a, a climate bank that's properly constructed. So I thank you for working with us. Absolutely, and we'll continue to work with you and your staff every step of the way. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Mark, thank you, and thank you for your good work in allowing me to be your partner on the Green Bank and on some in the methane emission reduction program, so much other uh, uh, important work that, uh, that we and others on this committee have done. Uh, they're waiting for me in the Finance Committee, but not for long, uh, in order to get through and ask questions. So I'm going to uh, close out there very quickly. Uh, but uh, in doing so, uh, I, I'm going to ask for the record if you have any final comments you'd like to, uh, to make. Uh, and this is for the record, not for right now, but any final comments you'd like to ask, like maybe a question you weren't asked, but you'd like to have been asked. And, and uh, if you had been, you give us what your answer would have been. So that's uh, one I'd like to close with. And also, I just want to thank you uh, for, uh, for joining us to, uh, today and, and feeling our, our questions, responding to them at some length. Uh, leading uh, EPA is not without its, its difficulties. And, uh, and I, thank, I think that, that you are, and it's not just my, my belief of this, but we've actually heard it from some of my Republican colleagues here today that are doing some pretty good work. And you don't hear that every, every day uh, in this in this room with uh, with us. But uh, you're doing a, an exemplary a job, and we thank you and, and the team that you you lead for EPA to be successful in protecting human health and the environment, while also protecting greater certainty and predictability to stakeholders. The agency needs robust funding and strong leadership team in place. And with that in mind, I'm hoping that this committee can lead again by example and work together in a bipartisan way to ensure that EPA has the resources and the leadership team that the American people deserve. Before we adjourn, a little bit of housekeeping. Senators will be allowed to submit uh, written questions for the record through the close of business on Wednesday, April 5th, and we'll compile those questions and send them to you, to our witness and your team. Uh, we'll ask you to reply by Wednesday, April the 19th. And again, with uh, heartfelt thanks, uh, this, uh, this hearing is adjourned, and I got to run. Thanks. Thank you.